very simple but powerful tool is the one sample t-test. Let's say we had a sample. Let's say that sample was x, and let's say it was a random sample of a population sample has 100 scores, and it ended up having approximately a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 50. So this code right here just generates this random series of numbers for us. So if we want to type in x, we could then see all those numbers. Now, we could get a mean of x. Here we see it's pretty close to 100. It's not exact. And we could get a standard deviation of x. Pretty close to 15. Not quite exact, but that's okay. So let's say we wanted to test this sample and see if it comes from a population that has a mean of 100. Now, we've randomly generated this um, data just that it has a mean that's pretty close to that. So let's test it anyway, though. How you would actually go about doing this is with a one sample t test. Now, to do this in R is nice, simple, and easy. There is a t test function. You need to specify the data you would like the t test to be run on for the first argument, and then the second argument then changes pending the type of t-test you're looking at. In our case, we want a one-sample t-test, so we need to specify the population mean that we want to test against. So mu equals 100. Let's R know that we want to test this data with a one-sample t-test with the null hypothesis specifying a population mean of 100. So we can run that code, and R will spit out a result for us. So it lets us know we run our one sample t-test on data x. It gives us the t-value, the degrees of freedom, and the p-value. So in this case, our t-value is less than 1, our degrees of freedom are 99, and our p-value is 0.6509. That lets us know that if the null hypothesis really is true, the probability that we would obtain these results by chance is approximately 65%. So this is a ultimately very likely sample to get by chance if we were randomly sampling from a population with a mean of 100. So in this case, we wouldn't reject the null hypothesis and it's not significant. Now, some other things to note that this one sample t-test gives us is the 95% confidence interval, which we can see is 97 and 103. And note that 100 would be included within this confidence interval. Now, let's say we wanted the 99% confidence interval. We can specify that with another argument where we specify the proportion that we want for our confidence interval. We run that, and now we can see that we have the 99% confidence interval. Notice that this does not change the p-value. Okay, All we're really changing is what our alpha level is when we specify this confidence interval. Let's just sort of pretend for a little bit that we actually wanted to test this against a sample with a mean of 50. So here we can see that our t value is now suddenly a lot bigger because this sample definitely did not come from a population with a mean of 50. Our degrees of freedom is 99, and notice our p value is now less than 2.2. And then we see this notation e minus sign 16. That scientific notation, and it's how R represents it, what it lets us know is that is 2.2 times 10, the negative 16th power. So if you were to put this in a straight decimal form, we would take that decimal point that's after 2, and we would move it 16 places to the left. So this is an extremely, extremely small number that is well below even an alpha level of 0.01. Now, there are times 
when you would like to have the 99% confidence interval or the 95% confidence interval, and having it in the output of the t-test is not exactly very helpful. So you can actually look at this a different way. There is a function called qt, which reports quantiles for the t distribution. So let's say you wanted the quantile corresponding to 0.5, or the median. That would be the first argument you would enter. And then the second argument you would end up entering is the degrees of freedom for this particular t distribution. Now, let's just work with the t distribution we're already working with. In this case, we have an n of 100. And so our degrees of freedom would be n minus 1 to get us 99. So if we ran this code, we can see that, hey, look, that quantile is 0 which makes sense the t distribution is symmetrical about zero. Now let's say we wanted a different quantile. This is where it can get interesting. So if we wanted, let's say, the 90th quantile, it would give us that t value, 1.29 and change. Now, QT does not report two-tailed critical values like you would often see in a textbook. So if we were to come over here to this graph, which has T values along the x-axis, and essentially the probability of these T values on the y-axis, what you actually have here is you would have this T distribution, this nice pretty graph. If we were to pick out the median, we'd be right here. If we wanted the 90th quantile, just like we have right there, it would be over here somewhere. QT only does it in a one-tailed fashion. It's just that if we wanted to use QT to look up a critical value for creating a confidence interval, we need to take whatever our alpha level is and divide it in half just that we get the proper quantile that will stand in for our critical value. So say we were looking at an alpha that was 0.01, just like we were before. Okay. When you would actually come down to QT, you would need to specify alpha divided by 2. This would get us the value that we need. And notice it's giving us a negative number in this instance. That's because the default is to report the lower tail. Now, if we're going to use this to create a confidence interval, we'd ideally like the upper tail, so we don't have to deal with those negative numbers. So in this case, we need to specify that the lower tail is false. This will get us that upper tail so that when we run it, voila, now we have a positive number. Now, if we wanted to create the confidence interval, the next thing that we're going to need is the standard error of the mean. So our standard error of the mean is going to be equal to the standard deviation of our sample divided by the number of scores in our sample, specifically the square root of the number of scores in our sample. Now we can get that in R assuming we don't have any missing values, with the argument length, which is going to report how many values are in an array. So, we now have our standard error of the mean of 1.5, such that when we now want to generate a confidence interval, we would take whatever our critical value is for t and multiply it by the standard error. So, let's go back to our code and let's edit it a little bit. Let's save the quantile we're generating is t crit and now let's create an upper limit where we would actually have the mean of x plus our standard error of the mean times our t crit and a lower limit where we would have the mean of x minus our standard error of the mean times t crit 
So in this case, what we would actually have, if we go in and we look at it, assuming I run the code, we would have upper limit of 104 and a lower limit of 96.71048, which when we come back up here and look, is exactly what it gave us in our one sample t test. So you could generate these on your own, just that you don't actually need that t test function.